So uh, actually, it's a great start uh, while we are waiting for everyone to join. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly remind uh, what INEO is uh, for those of you who missed the first webinar. So just briefly, INEO is a company which develops technologies dedicated to horse performance and health monitoring. We have two brands. So the first one is the training solutions one. And so we have one product, which is Equimeter. It's a sensor that collects GPS, cardio, and locomotion data to monitor racehorse performance. And the goal is to enable trainers uh, to optimize the performance with their, uh, of their horses with tangible information. Then we have the vet services brands, which actually have two products. Uh, the first one is Equimeter Vet. So this is a veterinary tool that collects a scientifically validated ECG while also collecting cardio, GPS, and locomotion data. And finally, we have our latest product, Equisim. So this tool quantifies locomotion to assist veterinarians during their diagnosis of equine locomotion asymmetries. And now I can leave the floor to Michael and Emmanuel to start the webinar. Well, thank you very much, Gabrielle. And uh, thank you to Arianeo for putting up this series of great webinars. Um, I'm Dr. Van Erk, and it's my great privilege to introduce to you Dr. Mike Davis. Mike Davis um, is known to us uh, equine sports medicine veterinarians. Um, he's, a, he's a superstar in, in, in our area. He um, graduated from Texas University in 1984, and um, he did a master's in equine internal medicine at Virginia Tech followed by a PhD on respiratory physiology at John Hopkins University. He is one of the few vets to be double boarded. That means he has a speciality in internal medicine and a speciality in sports medicine and rehabilitation. He has written a lot of um, groundbreaking scientific publications, uh, more uh, lay publications as well, and book chapters. So he knows exercise physiology inside out. And if you have missed the first webinar that um, he gave a few uh, weeks ago, then I would encourage you to have a look at it because this is the continuity of the topic that we touched upon last time uh, about fatigue. Now we're going to talk about how can you get the most out of each horse, knowing his physiology. So Mike, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and as uh, Emmanuel uh, indicated, the first webinar last month provided an overview of the horse as an elite athlete. Horses are capable of excelling at a wide range of athletic activities, spanning from lasting only a few seconds to lasting hours, and providing demonstrations of blinding speed, raw power, and astonishing grace. But this diversity comes at a price. In order to compete at a very high level, we must improve on what nature has delivered to our barn through conditioning and training. And the profound diversity of athletic disciplines that involve horses translates to equally diverse approaches to conditioning and training. It is impossible to cover them all, but what we will cover in this webinar are the principles of conditioning and training horses that apply to all disciplines. This will serve as a reliable foundation for your individual efforts with the different athletes in your barn. The first important concept to embrace is that conditioning is not the same thing as training. It's extremely common to use these terms interchangeably and in casual conversation, that's fine. However, it's important to know the difference as you will see later in this webinar. Conditioning is a change to the physiology of the horse. It's, it's the changes that allow the horse to do more, whether it be more power, more speed, or more endurance. Conditioning and training are two sides of the same coin, but training is mental. It's the process of learning, both consciously and unconsciously, how to do something better. Different disciplines may emphasize conditioning over training or training over conditioning, but both are required in order to be an athlete. They're dis they are distinct processes and a solid program designed to prepare a horse for athletic competition will explicitly include both. 
If you were able to attend the first webinar, you got a full a few hints as to the specific goals of conditioning. Basically, for any form of exercise, there are one or more physiological processes that limit the exercise capacity of a given athlete. The goal of conditioning is deceptively simple. Increase the cap capacity of those limiting physiological processes, and you increase the exercise capacity of the athlete. Bone becomes stronger, heart becomes bigger, and the muscle develops more mitochondria to produce ATP. If you understand what limits performance for the activity of choice, then you know what needs to be conditioned. And although disciplines require both conditioning and training, the endurance horse represents the extreme in terms of relying almost entirely on conditioning of different tissues and organ systems in order to achieve excellence. The other side of the coin is training. Training is the same as learning, but the learning takes place both consciously and subconsciously in the form of refined neuromuscular control and the development of what is commonly referred to as muscle memory. The ability to perform a specific movement smoother and more precisely through repeated practice of that movement. The goal of training is to take an action that was the product of conscious thought and make it an automatic response that no longer requires conscious thought. And then take that automatic response and make it a reflex. Organically, this is accomplished through the, uh, the alteration and refinement of neural control, including in some cases, the development of new neural connections. Although equine sport requires some training, dressage is probably the best example of an equine sport that relies heavily on training compared to conditioning. There are several principles of conditioning that need to be understood in order to construct a rational and effective conditioning program. They are important because failure to follow these principles are the most common mistakes made by trainers of athletes. And I'm talking not just horse trainers, but all trainers of all athletes. The first principle is that the athlete is going to conserve its resources, its cellular energy, and its nutrients. Horses, like most mammals, have evolved over millions of years, and life during those millions of years was not easy. In particular, Acquiring food was not easy. It required effort and success was not all certain. A full hay barn and feed room is a very recent development compared to how horses lived in the wild. What does that mean for conditioning? Conditioning requires resources. A horse has millions of years of cellular programming built in expecting resources to be scarce. And that programming includes not expending resources unless it is forced to expend resources. That means that a horse will not build the tissue necessary for increased exercise capacity automatically. Although proper nutrition is essential, you can't simply feed your way to fitness. You have to provide a reason for the horse to change, and then you have to provide the resources for that change to happen. The second principle of conditioning addresses that reason to change. Modern conditioning follows the principle of progressive overload, which states that in order to stimulate change, that is, in order to create the signal that increased capacity is necessary, you must overload the system just a little bit. You have to stress the system. If the system is already capable of handling the stress, then there's no reason to reallocate precious resources to make a change. All of the systems associated with exercise have the ability to detect that little bit of excess stress. For example, the job of bone is to withstand the large forces that are generated during exercise. And in order to best accomplish that, the bone will have to be made stronger. Stress the system a little bit and it will get a little stronger. And then when it is adapted to that, stress it a little bit more. That's the progressive part of progressive overload. It will be necessary to push the horse past what it can accomplish easily. 
but in doing so in a progressive manner is the key. Exercise is not the same thing as conditioning. Just because you jog the horse 30 minutes does not mean that a conditioning stimulus has been created. If the horse is already adapted to 30 minutes of jogging, then doing more of that accomplishes little in terms of conditioning. That may be fine if the horse is already as fit as you need the horse to be, but it's not going to be fine if you are seeking more fitness. The last principle of conditioning deals with the specificity of conditioning, and you will undoubtedly recognize that it is a logical consequence of the first two principles. Specificity means that only the systems that have been stressed will respond to change, and the change will be formulated to specifically address that stress. If the stress delivered has to do with the slow demand for raw power typical of weight pulls, the adaptation will be increased muscle capacity for delivering slow power. It won't be speed. And if during that work, the horse didn't stress its cardiovascular system, then you shouldn't expect those workouts to result in increased cardiovascular capacity. An endurance horse spends a great deal of time at low speed. And while it will likely adapt its skeleton, muscle, and heart, to that sort of exercise, that preparation may not create bones that can withstand high speed stress because that hasn't necessarily been part of its conditioning. And a horse that hasn't gotten hot is unlikely to specifically improve its capacity to dissipate heat. Systems don't change unless they've been stimulated to change and will only change to address that specific stress. Having outlined the principles of conditioning, we can now highlight training. There's really only one principle of training and it highlights the important difference between training and conditioning. Whereas conditioning involves the controlled induction of just a little bit of fatigue in the system being conditioned, and that may be the whole horse. The goal of training is to avoid fatigue. Training is learning and there is an abundance of knowledge proving that learning, changing the nervous system in order to improve function, occurs most reliably in the absence of fatigue. Fatigue impairs learning. From a practical standpoint, this means that activities that are intended to stimulate learning should be done when the horse is not tired, and it may be necessary to improve a horse's basic fitness first in order to advance its preparation to the training phase. Now, it's important to understand that although I've made a distinction between conditioning and training, these processes are inevitably combined to varying degrees in day-to-day -day preparation of an equine athlete. There are always activities that can be implemented that accomplish both conditioning and training simultaneously. My point is that the trainer must understand that although it is necessary from a practical standpoint to pursue both at the same time, it's also necessary to understand what is happening in the horse in order to ensure that the activities are appropriate and the expectations are clear. So let's move to discussing specifics of conditioning by system, starting with the skeleton. We'll also introduce the concept of the force deformation curve that is typical of most tissues. A little bit of force may result in a little bit of deformation, but there reaches a point in which too much stress results in too much deformation and failure of the tissue. Obviously, this is the area to avoid when employing the principle of progressive overload. The long bones of the skeleton are under compression, compression stress from the moment the foal stands and bears weight. And that compressive stress results in a minute amount of deformation that is sensed by the bone itself. The deformation results in increased bone strength, and the resulting increase in bone strength results in less deformation until an acceptable balance is reached. But walking results in a sudden and substantial increase in compression because now the weight is being supported from moment to moment by fewer legs. Trotting results in even more stress, and galloping results in a tremendous amount of stress. When these activities take place, 
the greater deformation results in a stronger signal to increase bone strength until the bone is strong enough to withstand the stress with minimal deformation. But all of this takes time. Skeletal tissues take the longest to adapt to the stresses imposed by athletic conditioning. A couple of decades ago, there were a series of very large studies that systematically examined how horses' skeletons adapted to the stresses of high-speed galloping. And these studies now provide a critical foundation for the understanding of athletic conditioning. Recalling that we will have to progressively stress the skeleton in order to stimulate an increase in strength, these studies showed that only high-speed training, four and a half meters per second or about 50 kilometers per hour, was sufficiently stressful to result in a measurable increase in bone strength. Medium speed training did not sufficiently stress the bone in these athletes to cause an increase in bone strength, likely because the horses had already seen and responded to that stress before they were ever put into training. The other important point is that it didn't require a lot of high speed training. In this study, only seven high-speed gallops spread out over five weeks, or roughly one every six days, and the gallops only needed to last about 40 seconds. It didn't require a huge amount of running, and the investigators provided a substantial amount of rest between those gallops to allow the bone to respond. Other aspects of those studies and similar studies have confirmed that as a general statement, all aspects of the skeleton not just bone, but also cartilage, tendons, and ligaments, demonstrate similar properties. In order to adapt them to the very large stresses associated with equine exercise, they require just a few episodes of force to activate the adaptive process, but then they require a relatively large amount of time to respond to that activation before repeating it. But there are still some important differences between skeletal tissues, and perhaps the most important is that while bone can be stimulated to adapt throughout the life of a horse, cartilage and tendon appear to have a more limited time frame. Studies have suggested that after the horse reaches skeletal maturity, the growth plates close and the horse has reached its mature height, cartilage and tendon become less responsive. The practical implication of this phenomenon is that conditioning of the cartilage and tendon needs to occur at a relatively young age when the horse is still a bit less intelligent and capable of the kind of juvenile silliness that can lead to injury. Fortunately, it may not require a lot of compulsory exercise. Many scientists in the field believe that simply putting yearlings in a large enough paddock to allow them to play with each other will produce enough high-speed deformations to stimulate adaptation. In order to discuss the conditioning of skeletal muscle, we must first expand our understanding of the different types of skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is comprised of different fibers, and the different fibers have different metabolic characteristics. We'll start with the type 2X fi muscle fibers, because that's how most, mus most muscles start out in life. Type 2X fibers are very quick but also easily fatigued because they don't have a huge number of mitochondria that allow them to produce large amounts of ATP. Instead, these fibers rely on anaerobic metabolism of glucose, mostly stored inside the cell as glycogen, to produce a handful of ATP and lactic acid. And the lactic acid is then excreted into the blood to be carried away and metabolized elsewhere. Type 2X fibers are useful for quick, short exercise but not useful for long duration exercise. Next in the list is the type 2A fiber. The primary difference between the type 2A and the type 2X is that type 2A fibers have more mitochondria. This makes them less susceptible to fatigue, at least at lower exercise intensities. They still can rely on glycolysis for the rapid ATP production from limited amounts of glycogen, and that process can still run out of steam quickly, but they have mitochondria to fall back on to keep things going at a slower pace. Last but not least are the type one muscle fibers, which are slower than type twos, but have lots of mitochondria so that they are fatigue resistant. 
They may not have a lot of stored glycogen, but they can pull fuel out of the bloodstream and completely combust it in the mitochondria to supply a slow but robust amount of ATP. As you might imagine, the different equine athletic disciplines will rely on different muscle fiber types and effective conditioning will increase the specific muscle fiber type most suitable for the specific type of exercise. Dr. Kathy McGowan, back when she was the unmarried Katherine Tyler, published a series of studies that continue to be valuable in illustrating exactly how to adapt muscle to specific types of exercise. Her studies proved the point that equine muscle follows the principle of specificity of conditioning. If you subjected the horse to prolonged low speed exercise, as illustrated in phase one of her studies, the muscle responded by increasing the type amount of type one muscle fibers, the fibers that are best suited for that type of work. When they moved to, into phase two and exercised the horses using a mix of moderate intensity and high intensity exercise, the investigators reported the logical shift towards type 2A muscle fibers. And when they increased the amount of high intensity exercise, the horses responded by increasing the muscle fibers that are best suited for high intensity exercise, type 2X muscle fibers. These studies also illustrated the critical point that changing around muscle fiber types requires a lot of changes in gene expression and subsequent protein synthesis and the full expression of that adaptation takes a considerable amount of time. In contrast to adapting bone to handle more force, changing the way muscle supports exercise is a more complicated process. In many instances, being able to change the skeletal muscle will start with the stressful stimulus causing translation of genes in the nucleus of the cell. Each gene may require thousands of ATP molecules to form the chemical bonds needed to produce the template for making the new protein, and then require thousands more to actually build the new protein. And there may be thousands of proteins needed, ranging from the actin and myosin that actually perform the work to the enzymes that make more ATP and the transporters that regulate cell function. Not just one or two copies, but dozens and dozens of copies in each cell and millions of cells. That's why cell growth and maintenance is best performed at rest. Within the muscle cell, there is a constant competition for ATP. The basic cellular machinery wants the ATP for translating genes and making proteins, and the actin and myosin want the ATP to fuel contraction and relaxation. As long as both demands are not too large, the muscle cell has enough ATP for both processes. However, during exercise, the demand for ATP for contraction and relaxation dramatically increases, and the cell must make a choice. And drawing on its 40 million years of being towards the bottom of the food chain, actually becoming food, if exercise is not successful, the muscle cell switches off protein synthesis and devotes all of its ATP to fueling muscle contraction and hopefully escaping to grow another day. Fast forward to modern times when the vast majority of our equine athletes are performing for our benefit instead of trying to outrun a predator and the same choices are nevertheless made. Exercise is necessary to create the stimulus for a conditioning response, but then a variable amount of rest is needed for the horse to respond to that stimulus. After exercise is completed, the cell needs to catch up with energy production and storage before it can start synthesizing new proteins to increase exercise capacity. Failing to provide the horse with enough rest after a conditioning stimulus violates the conservation of resources principle of conditioning and is a very common mistake. A horse may not appear to put on as much muscle mass as expected due to a delay in turning on the protein synthesis, and a trainer may respond by pushing the horse harder, which is exactly the opposite of what needed to happen. The horse gets pushed harder, protein synthesis stays off longer, and you continue to lack the desired response. The most definitive way of tracking changes in muscle fiber types is to obtain a muscle biopsy and directly examine the muscle fibers. 
This is an invasive procedure, and while it has a vital role in diagnosing some types of muscle disease, it's not practical for tracking progress in muscle conditioning. Instead, one can infer changes in muscle fiber types if you understand the lactate shuttle. We discussed this in the first webinar, but it merits a repeat here. The muscle fiber types that I've described can also be divided into lactic acid producers and consumers. Type 2X fibers are glycolytic fibers and therefore produce lactic acid that is excreted into the blood at a rate that we abbreviate RA, or rate of appearance. Type 1 fibers are oxidative fibers that consume lactic acid that they have taken up from the blood at a rate that we abbreviate RD, or rate of disappearance. Type 2A fibers fall somewhere in between, depending on how hard they're working. At low levels of work, they are lactate consumers, but at very high work rates, they may become lactate producers. Lactate can also be removed from the blood by the liver, and that activity also contributes to the overall RD. The point is, is that there is always lactic acid being produced by glycolytic fibers, and there is always lactate being consumed by oxidative fibers. The resulting concentration of lactate in the blood is simply the balance between RA and RD. As discussed in the last webinar, the rate relationship between different fiber types and the pattern of fiber type recruitment during exercise results in a familiar lactate speed curve. At low levels of exercise, the horse is primarily using type one or oxidative fibers instead of glycolytic fibers. So blood lactate is low. As speed increases, the horse progressively starts to recruit more and more glycolytic fibers, first type 2A and then type 2X, and the production of lactic acid increases. At some point, the increases in speed are driven entirely by recruitment of glycolytic fibers, and the curve starts to become vertical as more and more lactic acid is produced. With this arrangement in mind, changes in muscle fiber type can be inferred by changes in the lactate speed curve. As a, muscle, as a horse adds oxidative fibers to its muscle mass and has those fibers available to recruit for increased speed, the curve moves to the right, and VLA4, the speed at which the curve crosses the four millimole per liter line, increases. In this example, a mere 5% increase in the number of oxidative fibers, which can be either type 1 or type 2A fibers that are working at a moderate intensity, results in a VLA4 increase of 1.5 meters per second. Users should recognize the limitations of this approach at monitoring conditioning-induced changes in muscle fibers. If your horse is participating in an activity that places a premium on type 2X glycolytic fibers, such as sprinting or rodeo events, then seeking a shift to the left may improve the horse's competitiveness. And you can't lose sight of the obvious. There is little value in a racehorse that has a fast, VLA4, if the horse's maximum speed is still well below its competitors. This test is merely a tool, a valuable tool, that can provide some useful insight into the horse's progress in athletic preparation, but it is just a single piece of information in a complex system. So now let's turn to the cardiovascular system. Its job is to simply move blood around, and with that blood, the various substrates and waste products of metabolism. A normal horse with a normal cardiovascular system has a pretty easy time at rest, with the majority of the blood flow going everywhere except muscle. However, when the horse starts to exercise, the distribution of blood throughout the system starts to shift, with more and more blood going to the working muscle. At low exercise intensities, this doesn't pose a problem for the horse because it can simply speed up the heart rate. Up to about 60% of maximum heart rate, all of the different tissues in the body are getting their normal blood flow. But when exercise intensity gets higher, choices have to be made because the available cardiac output is starting to run low. The first choice is to decrease blood flow to the abdominal viscera. 
not enough to cause damage, but enough that one of the options for clearing lactate from the blood starts to disappear. With reduced blood flow to the liver, lactate will start to increase a bit. The horse also loses the liver as a source of glucose, thus having to rely more on the limited glucose that is stored inside the muscle cells. When exercise drives the heart rate too close to its maximum, another choice is made, decreased perfusion to the skin. This results in decreased heat, heat dis dissipation since the blood to the skin was delivering heat to be sweated out. At this point, with more and more heat being generated and less and less being dissipated, the horse gets very hot and eventually is forced to slow down. This makes the goals for conditioning the cardiovascular system pretty simple. Increase the available cardiac output. With increased cardiac output, all of those processes and sacrifices will still occur, but will occur at a faster speed. The strategy for increasing cardiac output is similarly simple. Increase the venous pressure that pushes blood into the heart. Remember, at maximum heart rate, the heart has only about a sixth of a second to fill, so there needs to be high pressure driving the blood into the heart. With increased filling, you get increased stroke volume. And stroke volume increases even more with increased size and strength of the cardiac muscle itself, so that more of the blood inside the heart is forced out into the arteries with each beat. So how do you stimulate the conditioning of the cardiovascular system? You exercise at or above maximal heart rate. In contrast to the other systems, the cardiovascular system is capable of gaining capacity very quickly because the majority of the increase in cardiac output is actually due to expansion of plasma volume. That is the portion of the blood that's mostly water. With the proper stimulus, the end result is a horse that drinks more and urinates less for a period of time until it has reached the plasma volume and resulting cardiac output that can support the exercise being demanded. Whereas we were talking months for bone adaptation and development of skeletal muscle, increase in cardiovascular capacity can require only a few weeks of high intensity exercise. Compared to many of the other systems, monitoring the cardiovascular system can be relatively easy. Typically, a horse will reach its maximum heart rate at a speed considerably slower than its maximum speed. And until it reaches the maximum heart rate, the relationship between speed and heart rate is a relatively straight line. There are many different devices currently available to measure heart rate of an exercising horse, including a very nice setup that also records speed that is sold by our webinar sponsors. Using this system, a trainer can simply record the speed at different submaximal heart rates and construct a line that provides a visual representation of the horse's relative cardiovascular fitness. Each speed requires approximately the same amount of cardiac output, but if conditioning has resulted in an increase in stroke volume, then the horse requires fewer heartbeats to achieve the required cardiac output. And this can be readily recognized as lower heart rates for the same speed and align with a more shallow slope. These systems are read, easily implemented and once it becomes a habit to equip the horses with the monitoring system, a robust record of cardiovascular fitness can become a basic part of every horse's training record. The last system we'll consider is the respiratory system. Compared to the other systems, this one is not as well designed. At peak exercise, there may be a 20-fold increase in the amount of air being moved in and out of the lungs, but that has come at a cost of over 500 times the amount of energy being used to move that air. And despite the 20-fold increase in the amount of air being moved, it's not enough and the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the lung has failed, resulting in a low blood oxygen and a high blood CO2. Until recently, we believed that we just had to accept this. There is no evidence that these limitations could be improved by conditioning. But that's not necessarily true, because it is likely that key parts of the respiratory system can be conditioned. I'm talking specifically about the skeletal muscle parts 
the skeletal muscle that keeps the pharynx and larynx open during exercise, and the diaphragm that is responsible for powering inhalation. To some degree, skeletal muscle is skeletal muscle, no matter if it's being used for locomotion or for breathing. If we can improve the skeletal muscle used through locomotion through progressive overload, we can do the same for skeletal muscle used for breathing. Colleagues at the University of Bristol have been systematically studying whether specific overload training of breathing will increase the strength of the skeletal muscles involved in ventilation. And although these efforts are not yet complete, the preliminary evidence is very encouraging. Using a device that basically forces the horse to intermittently breathe through a small high resistance tube, Dr. Fitzharris and colleagues have demonstrated specific improvements in upper airway skeletal muscle and increased breathing strength. It is likely that in the foreseeable future, they will be able to report whether this approach increases maximal exercise capacity. Ultimately, the goal is to condition and train not just a portion of the horse, but the entire athlete. So at some point, all of these individual lessons need to be synthesized into a global plan. Hopefully, you've seen how to pull this all together. First, you condition the skeleton. It needs the least amount of actual work and the most amount of recovery time, and it needs to be done ideally when the skeleton has not yet reached full maturity so that you are building not only bone, but also cartilage and tendon. In doing so, you may have already started to condition muscle, but muscle can become more of the focus in the months prior to competition. The idea is to have a sufficiently robust skeleton to support the extended stresses that are required to stimulate muscle adaptation. Lastly, you focus on the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system may not need a great deal of specific attention, particularly if you're training for high intensity exercise and have already incorporated runs at maximal heart rate in order to produce fast muscle. But if you're training for endurance, and you have been keeping the horse at a low intensity prolonged workout for muscle, you may need a few weeks of higher intensity exercise to help the cardiovascular system catch up. Training is superimposed throughout this program, but at the beginning of the conditioning exercises, so that the horse is fresh and its brain is ready to learn. And as a constant reminder, make sure you are incorporating enough rest following whatever conditioning stimulus you're delivering. The final point to discuss is a recognition that the use of progressive overload to improve conditioning, while scientifically sound and proven, is not without risk. Every horse is different, so there is still a need for one-on-one -on -one assessment to determine when the horse is ready for conditioning to progress. Conditioning is supposed to be stressful, at least initially, but if the horse is successfully adapting, then the same workout becomes less stressful. Progressing on a calendar instead of based on what the horse is showing you will inevitably result in injury. One area that is showing remarkable promise for addressing problems while they are small and before they become large is the use of gait analysis and sophisticated machine learning to identify abnormalities too subtle to be recognized by even the most trained eye. These systems, like the equimeter system, can not only help track a horse's progress, but also provide early recognition of a, of a problem if it is used regularly. Equipment like this is becoming a requirement for 21st century preparation of elite equine athletes. This is an example of the equimeter system as it tracks heart rate, speed, and gait symmetry. As you can see, the horse has a reasonably consistent heart rate at a trot. Except for this workout during April of 2021, when its heart rate jumped by nearly 50% at the same speed. The next day, the horse had a substantial drop in gait symmetry, suggesting lameness. A veterinarian was contacted, the problem resolved, and a week later, the horse was back to a steady, normal heart rate. A program to produce a competitive equine athlete should be assembled to follow the proven principles of athletic conditioning, progressive overload, specificity of conditioning, and conservation of resources. Adhering to these principles will help the trainer avoid some of the common mistakes made in preparing horses for athletic performance. Modern science and technology have provided the knowledge and tools to make these efforts more sophisticated, 
but we are a long way from eliminating the art from the process. Success at the highest levels of competition requires not only that modern science bring to the table, but also the instincts and nuance and a considerable amount of luck to succeed in this business. And so I wish you good luck. Thank you for your attention and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Mike, for this really in-depth um, insight into how, how horses work, how they adapt to work, how we can actually help them so that they adapt better without, um, without injury. I was, um, I think Gabrielle um, with us. Um, yeah. We don't have any um, questions yet. So if you'll allow me, I have a few questions from Mike to start with, if that's okay. Yes, of course. And um, just for everyone who is still with us, uh, if you want to ask a question, you can just raise your hand uh, on Zoom and I message you so that you can activate your microphone and ask your question to Mike or Emmanuel. Okay, Mike, so I'll fire on if you'll allow me. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, it's really interesting that, um, you know, you, you stressed on the importance of rest because I think that that is something that um, a lot of uh, trainers or riders don't necessarily understand. They think that more is probably better and they want the horses to be absolutely ready. I know that this uh, period of rest can vary from uh, type of horse and type of exercise or equestrian discipline they're involved in, depending on their age as well. But um, if we take the example of a racehorse, a young racehorse that started starting training, how much um, intense exercise versus rest would be an, an average or a target that um, trainers should um, look for? Um, well, I guess uh, it, it's going to depend on what you mean by young <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and what, what its history has been. Um, you know, if, if you don't have, um, if, if you don't have a, a, a level of confidence that the horse has the skeleton to withstand high intensity training, then you're going to have to do that first. And those are, you know, that that's the, the sort of thing where the workouts are very brief and the rest periods are pretty long. You know, we're talking about nearly an entire week um, in uh, the studies that were done, um, you know, several decades ago in New Zealand, uh, Australia, um, you know, in order to build bone and tendon and cartilage, you know, a little bit, just less than a minute of high speed work but then five to six days of rest in between those high speed um, exercises. If on the other hand, you're reasonably confident that the, um, the horse has the skeleton to withstand those stresses, then you can move on to muscle and the workouts become longer and the rest periods become shorter. Um, so it, you know the the first question that you have to answer is what tissue are you targeting, um, and once you have that, you know that that's where the science kind of ends and the art begins because you know like you say, each each horse is going to be different and it's they you know it's uh, it's difficult to uh, to to specifically say this amount of time you know it's the 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 glib answer is well they need enough and it's like well you know that that's great but how much is enough you know i i've seen horses that um you know folks have been doing exactly what you've alluded to they're not getting the responses in fitness that they expect and so they assume that it's because the conditioning is not stressful enough and so they you know they, they crank it up a little bit higher. And sometimes that works if that was the problem. But sometimes the problem was the exact opposite. The this is a horse that for whatever reason needed a little bit longer than the average horse to, uh, to recover. And you know, instead of 
getting more rest, they get less, and so they never do recover. Um, you 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 pretty much have to look at the horse and and have a little bit of intuition as to when you, when you're failing to see the response, you you have to at least consider that one of the possibilities is that you're not giving enough rest. You know, the other po possibility being that you're not giving enough work. Um, right. it's, it's important for everybody to understand that both are possible. But I really liked your, your comment about, you know, changing a little bit the paradigms of what we're doing right now. And uh, certainly the trainers that adopt um, trackers to evaluate how the horse is adapting from week to week. It's such a valuable source of information because you know, if we take the um, example of um, flat racing, you've got these young horses that uh, exercise all together. And so if they're all equipped, then you can have your reference values for your group of horses, and then you can see how they shift. And this has allowed mm -hmm. to detect fairly early some some problems as you showed for an example of a, of a lameness but it's exactly the same thing as for training you can see when a horse is lagging behind or on the contrary a horse that has particularly good um capacity and can be pushed a little bit a little bit further right. i think we've got two questions gabriel yes so sandra you can activate your microphone Hi, can you hear us? Yes. There. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Yeah, super. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. I, I really enjoyed the first one and this one as well. Um, I'm, I'm a little older now, but years ago I was on the Canadian rowing team and what you're talking about training and conditioning athletes is exactly what I learned when I competed at the international level and won a few medals and that sort of thing. So I, I really appreciate um, how you're expressing this too in, in horse terms. And it, it does apply in general athletic terms. Um, I so I thank you first before I even ask my question. I I also was um, in Canada a jumper rider and a three day event rider, but now I've moved to Vienna, Austria, and I'm here with the dressage horse because I'm getting older and the ground's getting harder. So I've decided <laughs> just to stick with dressage. Um, but I do have a specific question for you. Um, my horse a year ago, um, Grifflebine, I'm um, Splintbone. Um, kicked the wall, cracked it, ended up on stall rest. Now, of course, we're dealing with the musculature um, recuperating after long periods of stall rest and trying to rebuild. And everything's going great. She's she's just turning eight, so we're still very lucky that she's still developing. But we're dealing with a bit of a back muscle issue. And I've been, you know, doing all sorts of different things, laser, beamer, proper exercise. We do a lot of um, work in hand here because I'm connected with the Spanish riding, my coach is with the Spanish riding school. And, but I find that I'm so used to um, other sorts of training, as you said, the conditioning, the heart, and but back issues are, are seem to be very specific for dressage. And I have not come across this so much in jumping. Do you have any um, advice on strengthening more specific muscles? Well, and this is, uh, you know, uh, I had emailed with Gabrielle uh, going into this. You know, I'm, I, I have to say that I'm old too. Uh, and, um, and the, uh, the example that I've always liked to use that's becoming less and less relevant because more and more people weren't alive when this example was in place was a, uh, um, an American uh, uh, track and field athlete named Edwin Moses that uh, only, only us really old people will remember. <laughs> uh, but he, he illustrated specificity of, of conditioning beautifully. His workout, he, he ran the 400 meter hurdles. His workout consisted of 400 meter hurdles and nothing else. He didn't run stairs. He didn't lift weights. He didn't do anything other than 400 meter hurdles. And he went for nearly 10 years without ever losing a race, including several Olympic games and world games and all that sort of stuff, because he had optimized his body to the, the event of interest by only doing the event of interest. And so, you know, for, for conditioning a, a, a dressage horse, 
basically they need to do dressage. Mm -hmm. They need to be fit enough to do dressage for a long time to develop that muscle memory. Um, so th there is going to be a little bit of fitness that has to form a foundation there, but then it's just that repetitive movement of, and, and, and the exact type of repetitive movement that you're looking for, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, obviously in, in a lot of cases is not necessarily a, a, an entirely natural movement for the horse. It's something that they are having to learn their, their brain is having to learn it, but their muscles are also having to learn it. Um, right. So, you know, the, the, the key really is recognizing the fact that you've got training and conditioning of unique muscle groups um, going on simultaneously. And, and you can't push you, you, you're, you're walking a very, very fine line because mm -hmm. in order to, condition the muscle, you know, obviously you're going to have to stress it a little bit. You're after going to get it into a position where now learning is not necessarily taking place anymore. Um, because, you know, it's, it, you're, you're learning under a condition of fatigue. Um, so it, it's, it's a very, very fine line, a very precise line that you have to walk. Um, a little bit of fatigue is going to be okay. You just want to make sure that you're spending the vast majority of the time in sort of the, the neural learning phase. Um, and, and that means that it will take a little bit of time to build those muscles back. Um, mm -hmm. cause you're, you're, you're not pushing them as hard as muscle can be pushed, but you're trying to avoid ruining the learning that has to go along side by side. Yes. And I've always been, um, considered of the fact that horses uh, and I, i'm just assuming this of course that you know you can tell a person you'll work through this pain it, but horses seem to at least in my experience a bit of a memory of last time i did this it hurt so i'm not willing to work through this warm-up well, today so well, that's, I'm bad, very that's bad learning yeah. that, you know, that's learning the wrong lesson exactly yeah, I've been trying very cautiously to make sure that every day she warms up nicely and gently so she doesn't have that remembrance of the pain. Right. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah. So we have another question from Rodrigo. Yes. Hello. 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 Thank you for this very uh, interesting, elucidating uh, webinar. Uh, I think I will take probably months or years to digest it, but um, um, one question I had was, um, I, I totally get the, the part that you have to adapt the organism and to, to give him some rest in order for him to, to go where you want to go. But how long does it take to go back the other way, meaning that when you're going on a up scale and then you give too much rest or you forget mm -hmm. about what you are doing or whatever, is it the same amount of time that it takes to go up or does, does it stay longer on the uphill? It's, it's a little bit of both. Um, so for example, you know, starting with cardiovascular, um, cardiovascular conditioning um, takes the least amount of time to, to gain. Um, it also takes the least amount of time to lose. Um, you know, as, as soon as you stop providing that stimulus, you know, basically the horse, you know, drinks less and urinates more and starts to lose its plasma volume. And so in a matter of a couple of weeks, you can, you can noticeably lose cardiovascular capacity. Um, you know, and, and then you can replace it just as quickly. Um, one of the other uh, points that I, I like to make, and this is a lot of times as, uh, you know, important for endurance horses, um, in the case of cardiovascular conditioning, since it is so much of it is, is just simply water, um, you can also lose cardiovascular conditioning by sweating. And depending on the environment, depending on the workload, you can lose an entire program's worth of cardiovascular conditioning in a couple of hours 
of exercise if they're sweating really hard and not drinking a lot. Um, when you're looking at muscle, it will take a lot longer to lose the muscle. Um, when you're talking about bone, it will take even longer. Um, and in some cases, you don't you don't ever completely lose it. Um, but uh, as a as a very very rough rule of thumb, it it works in the opposite. You know, losing the conditioning follows the same pattern as gaining it. If it took a long time to gain it, you're probably going to take a long time to lose it. Um, but the, unfortunately, there are no ironclad specific uh, numbers for anything other than maybe cardiovascular, where we know that horses will lose cardiovascular conditioning during rest within a few weeks. All right, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah, that's, those are the problem of horses that have stall rest, because uh, for sure, we want to keep them in good condition. And, and um, I know that um, in the UK, there are a lot of uh, horse trainers that uh, swim the horses so that they maintain their cardiovascular strength and still uh, reduce the risk of injury by, by swimming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that would bring me to another question. What about um, track type? Is it interesting to change the type of track on which you're training so as to improve the adaptations of your uh, bone and musculoskeletal system in general? Well, there, yeah, there's certainly um, there's certainly an abundance of evidence to show that the stresses are different with different. Uh, um, different types of surface. And so, you know, logically you would expect that with different stresses, you have different adaptations. Um, whether or not, I, I'm not aware of anything that actually proves that, um, but I would imagine that most people that work in that field would, would operate under the assumption that um, if you, if you want if you want adaptations to support running on turf, um, yeah, you may need to run on turf at least a little bit. I mean, there, there's going to be some that is some adaptation that's just general for the fact that the horse is hitting the ground hard. Um, and so you don't necessarily need the specific surface for most of the conditioning, but there is something to be gained by uh, by varying the the surface to broaden the uh, the the spectrum of the type of conditioning that you're getting. Um, now you know the the other problem that we run into is that that whole uh, uh, question of um, which tissues are still adaptable. So you know the, if you change the forces on a horse that's seven years old you're probably only going to get a change in bone adaptation. Um, the tendons and cartilage are pretty much what you've got now. Um, the, the time to do that would be when they're two or three. Mm. Um, so that, that's the one drawback to, to um, exposing them to different surfaces is that you do probably have a very narrow window. Oh, thank you. We have a question from Chris Navas. Chris, your mic is open. Hello. How are you doing? How are you doing? Pretty well, pretty good. Hi, Dr. Davis, how are you? That hey, was Chris. great. Uh, I have a quick question about what you explained about uh, approximating the, the changes in muscle fibers using lactate. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the curve, shifts to the to the left as as you uh, develop more anaerobic fibers would it also make sense to not only looking at does it go left or right of that but also look at does it go up or they, would there make sense to look at maximal production rate or maximal production or once you go over four is it just such a steep curve that there's doesn't make sense and it's hard to yeah, uh, it, it, 
I think you've hit the nail on the head. One, you know, as the as the curve starts to get vertical, it becomes a little bit less precise, um, both from the standpoint of you know plotting it against speed, but also just uh, for the vast majority of the tools that we have for measuring lactate, you know, the lactate measurements become less precise when you get, you know, you, you get up over 20 millimoles per liter and, and yeah, you know, it, it, it may be 25, it may be 35, but, you know, it, it, it just becomes a lot, the, our instruments become less um, accurate. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a lot to be gained. Um, that's where it j simply becomes a question of, you know, walking away from the lactate curve and seeing just how fast is the horse going? Yeah. You know, if the horse is not, you know, it, it's great to have it move left, but if it moves left and the horse's maximum speed is only six meters per second, you're probably not going to win anything. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was reading about cyclists and stuff, and in, in, it seems like apart from they use this Vila max number to approximate, not apart from VO2 to use aerobic capacity, Vila max to use an aerobic capacity. It sounds, it sounds like such a nice concept, but the practicality in the horse seems to seems to be difficult now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, and, you know, there, there aren't... Uh, um, you know, when we're talking about moving the curve to the left, um, we're talking about, about events that last for, you know, less than a minute. And there just aren't any cycling uh, events that last that short, unless I'm riding. Uh, that, that's about as long <laughs> as I stay upright. Yeah, cool. Thank you very much. You bet. Yeah, the, the practicalities of measuring lactates also in the field is quite interesting, because if you have you know, young thoroughbreds and you have to stop them. <laughs> so next, okay, you've run, let's take a, a drop of blood from your jugular vein and that creates kind of a mayhem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you want to make sure that the blood is actually coming from the horse and not from the, the veterinarian. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Bob Leonard is um, waving at us. Yep. Bob, do you have a question? Yeah, I am. Uh, I train thoroughbred. And our typical pattern with young horses, uh, two-year-olds, in, in the breaking process, the training, and we, as soon as we have them mentally ready, which usually 30 to 45 days, we use small sprints, like a 16th or an 18th or an eighth mm -hmm. of a mile. And, and we'll do one to two of those a week. And we've had really good luck with bone formulation on that you know lack of buck shins and that kind of stuff does that violate any of the principles that we're talking about no no that that is exactly you know starting out with a horse that you don't know for certain has the bone to to withstand those high speed impacts you know you, the first thing you do is prepare the bone um and and like you're saying it doesn't require that that long of a of a distance. The studies that were done uh, years ago, you know, they, they, uh, um, they used about a 40 second high speed run and they, and they de demonstrated that that was sufficient, but that doesn't mean that um, shorter wouldn't still work. I mean, there, there have been, there's been some suggestion from other labs that they talked about as few as a dozen um, high speed strides is all that's necessary to stimulate the bone. And, and what you're talking about, you know, would go, go along very nicely with that. Okay. We're talking about 12 to 15 seconds usually. Right. Yeah, and, and, and at a high, high speed, the horse is going to be doing about 120 strides per minute or two strides per second. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, you're right there in the 20 to 30 strides um and and then give them the re almost the rest of the week off yeah well we, we the training in between will be light uh, it also probably from from your what you've just given in your seminar it probably helps with the uh, cartilage in the muscle a little bit too on from that standpoint so yeah in, in a two-year-old absolutely and that's that's one of the things that uh you know making sure 
even even though like you you know kind of indicated mentally they need a little bit of maturity to keep from being too terribly silly um, right but you do need to address tendon and cartilage before they're fully skeletally mature okay thank you very much yep okay well we're slowly touching to the end of this yeah i think i think everyone has asked their questions so we're going to put an end to the webinar uh, thank you very much michael and emmanuel uh, for hosting the webinar it was as usual very interesting uh, and so we're going to meet again for our last webinar of the series uh, on the 31 31st of january uh, at the same hour so i'm going to send you the replay of the webinar and the practical sheets uh, later this week and shoot me an email if you have any questions regarding this webinar or the next one. Thank you everyone for your participation. Thanks. Thank and for the next one, we'll see what's going wrong. You know, where can all these concepts go wrong? <laughs> yeah. So hope to see Thank you there. You. See you Thank next you. time. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you for participating.